Today, I'm going to share three progressively more unbelievable stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm going to show you the photo that is famously associated with that story. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to refill the like button's Keurig coffee machine water tank, but instead of using water, use vinegar. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. On the evening of March 25, 2017, a 25 year old farmer named Akbar Solibiro was harvesting palm fruit at the local oil palm grove near his tiny village in Indonesia. Now, the way Akbar would do this is he would use this long curved pole and he would prod at the bright red fruit in the tree, knocking it to the ground, and then he would gather it up, put it in his cart, and wheel it back home to be sold for palm oil. Now, on this night, Akbar was actually working later than usual because his wife and kids were out of town for a couple of days visiting family, and so there was no real reason to head back home because the house was empty. But Akbar was actually just fine with that because there was tons of ripe fruit, and so staying late would be quite profitable. But after a while, when the sun had finally set and it was getting difficult to actually even see the fruit in the tree, Akbar knew he really needed to leave soon because this area at night was actually not safe. And so Akbar gathered up the remainder of his fruit on the ground, he put his pole in the cart as well, and he began quickly making his way back home. Later that evening, one of Akbar's neighbors was asleep in their bed inside of their home when they woke up suddenly to the sound of something out in the jungle, not far from where Akbar had been harvesting palm fruit. And so this neighbor, when they sat up, they couldn't really tell what the sound was. It almost sounded like a stifled scream or maybe some animal that was fighting with another animal. But as the neighbor sat there straining their ears to try to hear it again, they didn't. All they heard was normal sounds coming from the outside. And so the neighbor decided that the sound they heard must have been a cat or maybe a monkey. And, you know, whatever it was, it couldn't have been a big deal. And so this neighbor went back to sleep. The following evening, so 24 hours later, another one of Akbar's neighbors walked outside of their home to begin the walk over to the jungle to harvest palm fruit. And when they went outside, normally around this time, Akbar would be coming outside as well because these two often went to the grove together. But, you know, this neighbor is looking and Akbar's not outside and he looks up at Akbar's house and it's dark and quiet. And so this neighbor's thinking to themselves, you know, where is Akbar? You know, I know he worked late last night. I didn't hear him come in and come to think of it. You know, I haven't seen him all day. And now, of course, I'm not seeing him as well. And so this neighbor, feeling concerned about Akbar, walked over and knocked on his door, but nobody answered. And so really starting to think that something could be wrong with Akbar, this neighbor went to Akbar's uncle's house. And when Akbar's uncle came to the door, this neighbor explained what was going on and their concern that, you know, something could have happened to Akbar. And so the uncle and this neighbor would go back over to Akbar's home and they would actually try the door. It was locked. They looked inside the windows and it looked like no one was in there. And they also noticed that where Akbar typically kept his cart that he would transport his fruit in, it wasn't there either, which made them think, you know, Akbar must still be out somewhere with this cart because this card is very important to him. And so ultimately, the uncle, after seeing the state of his nephew's home, he agreed with this neighbor that, you know, something was wrong here. And if they wanted to find Akbar, they really needed to get together a search party right now and go looking for him. So the uncle contacted the leaders of the village and they in turn rounded up all the able-bodied men in the village and they all got together with headlamps and flashlights and machetes and knives. And then all together, they began walking away from the village into the jungle in the direction of this palm grove, which was the place that Akbar had been last. And so this big group of men, they get inside the jungle and they begin walking along this path, which was the most likely path that Akbar would have taken to go to the palm grove and also to return from the palm grove. And as they're walking, you know, the sun is starting to set, it's getting dark, and the animals in the jungle, they're all making noises and kind of yelling at this group as they're moving through. And this group, they're shining their light around looking for any sign of Akbar, but there wasn't any. They were calling his name out, there was no response. 
And then at some point, as they got closer to the palm grove, they noticed there were a couple of bright red fruits, palm fruits, that had clearly been recently harvested that were scattered on the trail. And so the group began to fan out in this area, thinking that, oh my goodness, Akbar must be somewhere nearby. You know, maybe there was some sort of accident and he's fallen somewhere, or just something's happened to him, but he's got to be in this area. And so the group began fanning out off the trail, kind of hacking their way through all the underbrush. And then suddenly one of the men, after he hacked through a particularly dense stretch of the jungle, he looked down and saw something and began to scream and he raised his machete and began running forward. As far as we can tell, this is what happened to Akbar. The previous night, after Akbar had decided, you know, it wasn't safe to be in the jungle at night, he needed to leave, and so he gathered up all of his things, and he began walking along that path where the search party would find all that fruit scattered on the trail. And so he's walking along this path, and he thinks he's alone, he thinks he's okay, but in reality, he wasn't. He was being watched and followed very closely from something up in the trees. And so as Akbar moved along, this thing was kind of trailing him and seeing what he was going to do. And then at some point, this thing up in the trees began moving its way down closer and closer to Akbar. It was a 23 foot long reticulated python. It was a massive snake. And this snake came down and launched an attack on Akbar, grabbing the back of his neck with its powerful jaws. And as soon as the snake clamped down on Akbar's neck, he let out a stifled scream, which was the scream that had woken up that other neighbor who sat up in bed wondering what that was. That was Akbar screaming out. But that was the only sound Akbar could make because immediately the snake wrapped itself all around Akbar and squeezed him tight. And after crushing Akbar, breaking almost every bone in his body, the snake relaxed and then slithered off of Akbar. And so Akbar fell to the ground and was either dead or very close to death. And at this point, the snake opened up its jaws and positioned itself right in front of Akbar's head. And then it began kind of slithering itself forward, consuming Akbar head first. And the way pythons do this is they don't really chew on their victim. Instead, they kind of put their mouth over the top of whatever they're going to consume, and they kind of undulate and walk their bodies forward, driving the victim deeper and deeper into their body until they are completely consumed. And so the next night, when one of the members of the search party had gone off the trail and began hacking away and then saw something and charged after it with his machete, what he was seeing was the python who very clearly had a person inside of its stomach. You could see the outline of the person. And so this search party member ran forward and hacked the snake, opened it up, and there was Akbar fully dressed and deceased inside of the snake. On the night of February 19th, 2022, a 41-year-old woman named Paula Ruiz was working the reception desk at a four-star hotel in southern Mexico. It had been a long Saturday night with lots of tourists checking in and lots of confused tourists asking for directions or clarifications about things in the area, but it was finally nearing 11 p.m., which was the end of Paula's shift, and also things had calmed down near the reception desk. There wasn't much going on. And so Paula took a moment and grabbed her phone and checked it. And she saw there was a text message from her 19-year-old son saying he would be picking her up after work on his motorbike. And then just a couple of minutes later, Miguel, her son, actually walked in the front door of the hotel. He waved to his mom and said, you know, hey, I parked my motorbike just down the street. You know, whenever you're ready, we can leave. And so Paula, she was very happy to see her son. She walked over, she gave him a kiss and a hug, and then she began gathering her things. Paula loved the fact that her son was totally comfortable driving around town with his mom on the back of his motorcycle. Other teenagers might think that was awkward, but not Miguel. But Paula knew her son absolutely loved his motorbike and basically was always looking for an excuse to ride it. And so very likely that was why he was so eager to give his mom a ride home. And so finally, after Paula had gathered up her things and said goodbye to her coworkers, she and her son walked out the front doors of the hotel and they began walking down the road and around the corner to where Miguel always parked his bike whenever he picked his mom up from work. However, when they turned the corner and looked at the spot where Miguel said he had parked, 
his bike wasn't there. Now, at first, Paula asked Miguel, you know, are you sure you parked it here? You know, maybe did you park it farther down the road? But Miguel said, no, this is where I always park. I definitely parked it right here. And so Miguel became convinced that someone must have stolen his bike. That was the only explanation that made sense. But Miguel still had the keys to his motorcycle, which meant whoever had stolen it had likely hotwired it. And since that takes quite a bit of time to pull off components of the bike and kind of fiddle around with the wires, to make it start, Miguel was thinking that, you know, okay, maybe they're still in the area trying to hotwire it. Let's go look for them and get the bike back. Now, the city in southern Mexico where Paula and Miguel lived was called San Cristobal de las Casas, and it was a totally beautiful place surrounded by all these hills, but it was also a very dangerous place full of lots of street crime and violence and gangs that used the area as a hotspot for drug trafficking. And so this is not really a good place to be walking around at night, let alone trying to chase down some bike thief. But Paula and Miguel, they knew this, they lived there, they understood the risks. And Paula especially, she knew that Miguel was going to go looking for this bike because he loved that bike. And so Paula didn't hesitate and said, okay, Miguel, let's go looking. And she figured at a minimum, she could take a video or a picture of the thief if they found them with the bike, and then they could give that to police, and then maybe they could track the person down if Miguel and Paula couldn't get the bike back that night. And so Paula and Miguel began running down these side streets, looking all over the place for Miguel's bike. And you got a picture of some narrow alleyways with barely any lighting. I mean, this is a sketchy area. And so they're running around and then finally they turn a corner and Miguel sees up ahead his distinctive yellow motorbike. And he sees some stranger is pushing it along. Clearly this person is pushing it away so they can hotwire it. And so Miguel and Paula begin charging down the road and Miguel actually gets in front of this guy and stops him. And Miguel starts screaming at the guy to give him his bike back. And then Paula, she joins her son and she starts screaming at him as well and taking videos and pictures. And then as this is happening, another man on a motorbike came flying up behind Paula and Miguel. And as they did, Paula and Miguel heard the sound of the engine and they turned around and all Paula saw was this young man holding a gun aiming it at her son, Miguel, right at his chest. And so her motherly instincts kicked in and she leapt in front of her son and then not knowing what else to do, she raised her phone and took a picture. And then seconds later, there was a loud bang. And then suddenly this guy who had been trying to steal Miguel's bike gave it up. He dropped the bike. He took off running down the road. And the gunman, he too turned his bike around and sped off down the road, leaving Miguel and Paula in the alleyway. Except Paula was on the ground because a second after she took that photo, the gunman had shot her in the chest. Paula would be taken to the hospital, but she would die the following morning, orphaning Miguel and his three siblings. However, the photo that Paula took of her killer seconds before he killed her was such a high quality photo showing his face that just two days after her murder, police were able to use that photo to find the killer as well as his accomplice, and they were both arrested. If you didn't catch my live storytelling event last month on the official Mr. Ball and Discord server, then you kind of missed out. Not only were the stories awesome, at least according to me, but we also temporarily broke Discord because of how many people were trying to watch the event at once. But don't worry, you can be a part of our next live storytelling event on Discord if you just join the Mr. Ball and Discord server, which is completely free. All you have to do is click the link in the description of this video or click the link in any of my social media bios. Also, the Mr. Ball and Discord server is not just a place for live events. It's also a place where I make all of our biggest special announcements. And this summer, we have a couple of huge announcements. So if you want to hear those announcements, you got to get on the Mr. Ball and Discord server. Either click the link in any of my social media bios or click the link in this video's description below. Okay? Back to the stories. On the morning of February 25th, 2015, in a little house in the city of Cape Town in South Africa, 
a 17-year-old girl named Misha Solomon was packing up her homework in between bites of her breakfast. And as she did this, her mother, Lavana, walked into the kitchen with a big smile on her face, and she was holding up this beautiful red flowing dress, and immediately Misha knew what it was. Her mom had been making this dress by hand over the past couple of days. It was for a big school dance that was coming up, and she saw that it was now done. And so Misha, she put down her breakfast and her homework, and she rushed over to her mom, and she admired this gorgeous gorgeous dress and thanked her mom for all the hard work and said it's absolutely perfect. And then from somewhere behind Miche, her father, who was still sitting at the table, kind of grunted out, hey, isn't that dress a little bit revealing? And Misha and her mom kind of just rolled their eyes because they knew Misha's dad just loved his daughter and was very, very protective of her. And so basically anything she wore that wasn't full coverage was too revealing. And so Misha, after rolling her eyes, walked over to her dad. She gave him a big hug and a kiss. And she said, Dad, don't worry about it. It's just fine. And so after that, Misha went back to her breakfast. She finished eating, she packed up her stuff, and then she gave her mom and her dad another hug and a kiss and said goodbye. And then she headed out the front door out to the road where her aunt was waiting in her car. As Misha's aunt drove her to school, like she did almost every single morning, Misha began to notice her aunt was acting kind of strange and constantly looking behind her and looking in her rear view mirror. And finally, Misha said to her aunt, you know, what's going on? What are you looking at back there? And Misha's aunt would say, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm pretty sure there's a white car that's following me. And in fact, over the past couple of days, I've seen what I think is the same white car following us anytime I'm driving you to school. And so Misha just turned around in her seat and looked out the back window, and she saw there were dozens of white cars on the road, so it was pretty difficult to tell which one her aunt was talking about. But as she's looking, you know, none of the cars seem suspicious. And so Misha turned back around and told her aunt, you know, I think you're just being paranoid. Nobody's following us. There's no reason to follow us. A few minutes later, Misha's aunt pulled up alongside the front of the school and Misha said goodbye to her aunt. She thanked her. She hopped outside and she rushed into the school. And then Misha made her way up to the hallway where her first class was. And as she was walking down the hallway, her best friend, Cassidy Nurse, was walking up the hallway in her direction. And so right away, Misha sees Cassidy and she waves and smiles and begins walking towards her. But Cassidy gave Misha this kind of weird, lukewarm smile and then quickly looked away from Misha, and then Cassidy turned and bolted into the nearest classroom. And so Misha just came to a stop and just looked at the doorway where her best friend has disappeared, and she starts thinking to herself, you know, what's going on? Why did she do that? That was so cold. And then Misha began to think about the fact that actually, over the past couple of days, Cassidy had been acting really strange. It was like she was trying to avoid Misha, but Misha had no idea why. It wasn't like they were fighting. Normally, Misha and Cassidy were totally inseparable. They had met earlier that school year, and even though they were actually kind of far apart in age, Cassidy was in eighth grade and Misha was in 12th grade, it was like it didn't matter. It was like right away when they met each other, they had this special bond where they just had to be around each other all the time. They shared everything with each other. And certainly anytime they saw each other in the hallway, they would stop to chat or even go into a nearby bathroom and do each other's hair and makeup and share any gossip they had recently heard. So for Cassidy to act like this was just totally uncharacteristic and it really upset Misha. But just then the bell rang in the school, so Misha knew at this point she was now late for her class. And so she had to forget about whatever was going on with Cassidy and Misha just hustled down the hallway and went into her classroom. And so Misha, she takes her seat at her desk, she puts her stuff down and she's getting ready to listen to the teacher when suddenly the principal comes in without even knocking and without even saying anything to Misha's teacher, the principal walks right up to Misha and says, I need you to come with me. And right away, Misha's classmates, all who saw this, they begin ooing and aahing as if Misha is in huge trouble. But Misha's thinking to herself, I didn't do anything. Like, I have no idea what this is about. And so she kind of smiled like it was no big deal. She picked up her stuff and she followed the principal out into the hallway. But as Misha followed the principal down the hallway towards the principal's office, Misha's smile faded and she began to wonder, you know, what is this about? What's going on? And then finally, they got to the principal's office. The principal opened up the door. Misha went in first, and the principal trailed behind her and shut the door behind them. 
When Misha looked into the principal's office, she saw there were already two people inside who she didn't recognize. It was two women who were very serious looking, who were sitting on the side of the room. And as soon as Misha walked in, the two women, without introducing themselves, just told Misha to come over and take a seat next to them. And Misha, instead of doing that, just paused and looked at the women and said, what's going on? And at this, the two women kind of looked at each other and then one of the women piped up and said, Misha, we're here because the police sent us. And they sent us because of a photo that you and your very close friend Cassidy took. But before Misha could ask any questions like, what photo are you talking about? And really what's going on here? These two women would explain the whole situation to Misha. And basically what they did is they told her this long, very convoluted story that involved Misha, it involved Cassidy, it involved this photo. And by the end of this story, this explainer story, Misha had taken a seat and put her hand over her mouth in utter disbelief. And then when the women were done explaining everything, Misha had a million questions, but it was like she was so overwhelmed with what she was just told that she just continued to sit there with her hand over her mouth, totally silent. And then finally, Misha did break the silence by saying, can I please just call my parents? And at this, the social workers said, no, you can't. And in fact, the police are already at your parents' house. They're talking to your parents right now. And so you can't talk to them and you can't even go home. In fact, you have to come with us for tonight. And then the two women got up and they made their way out of the principal's office and they said, come on, Misha, you have to come with us. And so Misha stood up and she's totally flabbergasted. She really is like, how is this real life? And the principal at this point walked over and gave Misha a hug. And it was like suddenly the floodgates opened and Misha just began sobbing hysterically. And as she did, the social workers just stood there waiting patiently. And then as soon as it seemed like Misha was done crying, they said, come on, you really need to come with us. And so Misha, she let go of the principal and she followed the two women out of the school out to one of their cars. And once they got in the car, the two women explained to Misha that they were going to take her to a safe house for the night. But before they went to the safe house, they would need to make a quick pit stop at a local medical clinic. And so Misha, who at this point is not even asking questions, just said, okay. And so the women, they drove to the medical clinic. They were inside for just a matter of minutes. When they came back out again, they drove the rest of the way to the safe house. And when they got to the safe house, it just looked like a normal house on the outside. But on the inside, when the two women were leading Misha through and showing her where everything was, the kitchen, the bathroom, her bedroom, all Misha saw was all these other kids who were staying there who were orphaned and abandoned. And it started to give Misha a panic attack. And she asked the women again, can I please call my parents? and they said, no, you really can't. But one of the two social workers could tell that Misha, you know, she's having a breakdown. This is the worst day of her life, very likely. And so one of the two women actually offered to Misha to come home with her and stay at her house instead of the safe house. And Misha agreed. And so that social worker and Misha, they would leave together, they would get into that woman's car and they would drive to her house. And then the social worker told Misha that unfortunately now it was just a waiting game. They needed to wait for the police to get back in touch with them with more information. That night, as Misha lay in this woman's guest bedroom, looking up at the ceiling, wondering how the heck this had become her life, she began to think about the photo, the photo that her and Cassidy had took that had kind of started this whole horrible thing. And so Misha began to think about the day they took this picture, and all she remembered was that she and Cassidy were just kind of goofing around and smiling and making funny faces and just taking photos as they went. She certainly didn't think that one of those pictures they took would totally change her life. The following morning when Misha woke up, the social worker brought her to their office, the social worker's office, and there they met with the other woman who had first met Misha in the principal's office, and the three of them just sat in the office, not talking much, eating chicken wings and other snacks, just literally waiting for police to call them. And finally, they would call. And when they did, one of the social workers answered the phone, and as she listened to what she was being told, she began to frown, and by the time she hung up, she was crying. The news from the police was the news Misha had been afraid of ever since sitting in the principal's office the day before and hearing this whole crazy story about her and Cassidy and this photo. The special pit stop that Misha and the social workers made at the medical clinic the day before on the way to the safe house 
was so that Misha could get a DNA test. And now the police were calling back with the results of the test. And what the results showed was Misha Solomon was not actually Misha Solomon. Her real name was Zephanie Nurse. 17 years earlier, Zephanie Nurse had been stolen out of her crib at the hospital in Cape Town, and despite a massive manhunt for her, she was never found. And so this was a huge famous case in Cape Town, and most people assumed it would never be solved. But Misha's DNA had done just that. It proved that Misha's parents, who had loved her and raised her since she was a baby, were not actually her parents. Her mother, Lavana, was actually her kidnapper, and now she was under arrest. But even though this revelation was incredibly shocking and upsetting for Misha, it was not nearly as shocking as learning the identity of her real biological parents. The social workers took Misha from their office to the police station where they told Misha her real biological parents were waiting to meet her. And so once they went inside the police station, Misha gripped onto the social worker's arm tightly. She was incredibly nervous and she was led down a hallway to a door that was shut. And then finally, when Misha was ready, she pushed the door open and her real parents who were sitting right in front of her, they stood up and they ran towards her crying. But Misha just stood there stunned and silent, staring at them because these people, they were not strangers to her. She knew them extremely well. They were the parents of her best friend in the world, Cassidy Nurse. Which meant Misha, aka Zephanie Nurse, was Cassidy's sister. Months earlier, when Misha and Cassidy first met each other, the reason they hit it off so quickly, and the reason they had similar senses of humor and liked the same things, and looked so dramatically similar, is because they were literally sisters, they just didn't know it. And then one day they took a series of selfie photos of themselves and Cassidy, she would go home and show one of those photos to her parents and say, hey, look, my best friend, Misha Solomon, look how similar we look. And when Cassidy's parents looked at Misha Solomon, they instinctively knew that is our daughter. That is Zephanie Nurse. And so they would bring this photo to the police and the police would begin to investigate. And during this investigation, they began trailing Misha. So when Misha's aunt told Misha that she thought a white car was following her, she wasn't just being paranoid. Those were investigators following Misha around, trying to get a feel for her schedule because they needed to approach her when she was alone in order to get a DNA sample. They were worried if they contacted Misha and tipped off what they were doing, she would tell her parents, who were actually her kidnappers, and then potentially they might take Misha and run away. And so they couldn't risk that. They had to basically follow her around and wait for an opening to get this DNA test done. And so this was also the reason why Cassidy was acting so strangely towards Misha in the few days before the truth was revealed. It's because Cassidy knew about this investigation and the police told her, you can't tip Misha off. She will tell her parents, her kidnappers, and they might abscond with her. And so Cassidy basically felt awkward and kind of just hid from Misha for a couple of days. The woman that Misha had grown up with and called her mom for her whole life, Lavana Solomon, was ultimately convicted of kidnapping and sentenced to 10 years in prison. There has never been any evidence to suggest that Lavana's husband, so Misha's dad for her whole life, actually knew that the baby had been kidnapped because 17 years earlier, Lavana had been pregnant with their child but it's believed she miscarried and Lavana did not share that with her husband. Instead, she told her husband that she had gone into labor while he was at work and delivered their child. And so that's how they had this baby, Zephanie. When in reality, after Lavana had miscarried, she had at some point dressed up like a nurse, gone into the hospital and stolen Zephanie. For her part, Zephanie, AKA Misha, stayed in touch with both sets of parents, the fake ones and her biological ones. And she would say that, you know, she still loves the parents who kidnapped her because they raised her and they treated her well. And in fact, Zephanie would actually wear that beautiful flowing red dress that Lavana had stitched for her to her high school dance well after the news came out about who Lavana was. Misha also decided that she would just keep the name Misha because that was what she was used to instead of going back to her baby name, Zephanie. On a cold and snowy day in January of 1994, 
A land surveyor for the North Carolina Department of Transportation parked his car at the edge of Highway 421 in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. After walking just a few yards away from the side of the road, he was already swallowed up in the deep woods that stretched for miles into Waitaga County. Given the cold air and snow underfoot, the surveyor was paying close attention to where he was walking, that was, until the man glanced ahead at the fallen tree ahead of him, and before he saw something he just couldn't make sense of peeking out of the snow in the shadow of the upended roots. A moment later, he dropped the hard plastic case that contained his surveying equipment and nearly fell backward as he scrambled to get away from the mound of snow in front of him. Then, looking desperately through the thick trees for the other members of the survey team, the calm around him was shattered as he started yelling for help. So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's stories, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have hundreds more stories just like this one, many of which are only available on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music.